Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way, just like the guy I'm going to talk to uh, today on just an amazing tale of survival. But before we get there, I want to turn everybody to my website, markpattersonnfl.com. That is www. And there you can find all these amazing podcasts of people doing incredible things like the guest again I have on today and many, many others. Actually, I've got about 195 episodes. We're well over 100,000 downloads. I'm so appreciative to everybody who's gone on. Part of that is people going in and giving a ratings and review on iTunes. It helps elevate the popularity of the show. And it's important that we're all inspired. And I am certainly not alone with that. Also, I continue to raise money for Higher Ground, just a great organization here in Sun Valley, Los Angeles, and New York. Many of the people there uh, are uh, within the military, also have cognitive and adaptive issues. Of course, my daughter, Amelia, started a campaign within Higher Ground called Amelia's Everest, the Lotsi Challenge. And uh, we, are now, we are now well over $50,000 uh, uh, of raised funds. Again, every 100% of all the money going to that organization. And finally, um, as I prepare to launch for Mount Everest on March 30th, 2021, you can find a tab which you can actually track me going up and down the mountain. It'll be pretty cool. I'll also be doing live updates. So be sure to sign up with your email and check out the Garmin app that I have that you can actually watch all this drama play out right in front of you as I'm trying to call up the mountain. Okay, so on that note, let's jump into today's pod. I first want to introduce my guest, Matt Miller. Matt, how you doing? Good, Mark. How are you? I'm doing just fine, and I'm really excited to have you on. I mean, man, you've got a, quite the tale of survival, and so we're going to get into that. But we're, we're, I'm talking from Sun Valley, Idaho. You're in Scottsdale, Phoenix area of, of down there in Arizona. And, and I don't know how long ago we're going to get into it, but you've got this amazing tale of how you had to overcome uh, and find your way, a lot of the theme of this show. And a lot of it centers around a mountain. And I'm about ready to take off for a mountain. And so this will serve as some inspiration to me. But we're going to get into this just a little bit, the kind of the heart of everything. But the bottom line is I want you to tell the story. I'm not going to tell it for you, but you know, you had these grand plans to go down to Mexico and climb the third highest peak in North America. Of course, uh, Denali is number one, Logan up in Canada is number two, and you chose to go uh, south of the border and go climb a a volcano. And so if you could lead us through like, you know, kind of where this all started, I know you're with your dad and how things played out and we'll, we'll take some stop, uh, you know, a few stops along the road and we'll define exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, interrupt me as I go along, and, and thanks for having me, Mark. I was a 22-year-old kid. I, I, I played college baseball at Santa Clara University, and uh, so I grew up an athlete, and I grew up, too, here in Phoenix uh, with a really special relationship with my father. We grew up in the outdoors. I was so blessed to, uh, you know, we went to Alaska every summer. Just had incredible tales with my father. He probably should have died a long time ago, but somehow, as you know, Mark, it always works out, it seems like. and. Uh, until it didn't. And uh, that's what I'm talking about today, I guess. So I graduated Santa Clara. I didn't get drafted. I had a pretty, I think I enjoyed life a little too much my senior year and uh, came back, was trying to figure life out. And my father asked me to go on this climb and he had gotten into mountain climbing while I was away at school. And he had done uh, the Tetons, you know, nothing major, nothing like what you're doing. And uh, I asked, uh, of course, I was going to go along. What a great way to Get, you know, get away for a little bit. I had eight months in the real world since playing baseball before this trip. And so for me, it was really a way to get away and, and, and try to reflect what the hell do I want to do? It's the first time in my life where you can relate better than anyone. Like, you know what it's like when you're, when you walk out and there's no locker room anymore, you know, and when you don't have this thing that you're dire passionate about, what do you do? And uh, I was really struggling with that. So I was anxious to go. So Tagged along, and the mountain we went to is called Pico de Orizaba, which is a volcano outside Mexico City, uh, 18,000 feet roughly. Usually a really safe mountain where a lot of people go to get training because it's so quick to the States. And we went with, uh, there's three others, uh, so five total. And uh, our, our kind of our lead was a guy named 
I'll, I'll leave his last name, is it uh, anonymous Mike? And he had summited Everest a few times and had done some guiding work over there. So it was pretty well known. And we really kind of went in blind, just really trusting him that he knew what he was doing. And he had done it 20 times. And so that in conjunction with what we had read about the safety of the mountain felt pretty good. So we, we, uh, we go, and this is November 22nd, 2002. We stay at base camp, uh, at, which is about 14,000 feet. They drop us off there. And the idea was we, we would spend the night in this camp and you wake up about two in the morning and push to the summit. And the first three to four hours are, are walking through volcanic spree before you actually get to the glacier. And uh, so we woke up and I'll say this at nighttime, there was one window in this little hut we were at base camp and it happened to be a full moon and the, the north face of the mountain, which is what we were climbing, the, the Jampa Glacier there was facing right at us and it happened to be a full moon. So it was like daylight out. So hard to sleep, you know, and you're in this, you're in this tent with all these other international people from all over the world, you know, no one showered and, it was just chaotic, but for some reason, I remember looking out the window at this at this mountain, just staring at me like all night, sizing me up. And you could tell how dangerous it was by how shiny it was. And that was where we ran into issues. So, what is usually a safe mountain? The Jampa Glacier is probably about—I don't know if, you, if the podcast includes video, but it's about this angle. It's really steep and uh, probably about thirty degrees most of the way. So, if you slip and get going, you'll get going really quick. But usually, there's pretty good snow base from the monsoons and this year they had no monsoons and so yeah so so, so let, me, let me interrupt this will be uh this is the audio so people can't see that slope but it's a, it's a it's a yeah but it's a it's a good steep incline and basically what you're saying is that it was one big ice rink going up it was an ice skating ring at a steep angle exactly that if you slip if you slipped and uh had it at, at, you know five to ten feet of slide you're going to be going too fast to to stop anyone and so he, well, let me first talk about the last time. I remember the last time I tied my shoes. I remember getting to the glacier and we, we bent down to put our, uh, our crampons on. And that was a really vivid remember for me, man. I, I remember looking down, tying my shoes. And that was the last time I'd ever tied my shoes with my fingers. And uh, I can still remember it like it was yesterday. But anyhow, I remember tying my, cramp, my shoes back on once I got the crampons on and off we went. And about an hour into the climb, my father uh, had altitude sickness. And wasn't feeling well. So he started dragging behind everyone. And I stayed with him and kind of just walked directly behind him and let him walk right in front of me at his slower pace. And that way, if he fell or something went wrong, I could drop to my knees and, and try self-arresting and get on him. We weren't roped because it was so steep. We, uh, we felt that if, if someone went, it, was, it would just take everyone rather than, uh, so it was almost too dangerous to even rope. We're about 200 yards short of the summit. The rest of our team had already made it. We were moving pretty slow and uh, he slipped and fell. And uh, I went down to my knees and kind of like a hockey goalie and stopped him and traded him there. And that was when it got real, man. Holy cow. We dug a hole out in the glacier there, a little ledge, sat there, had some water. And he and I are sitting, you know, shoulder to shoulder, looking to the north. And you could look to the west and almost you see the smog of mexico city and you could look to the right and see the gulf almost and you know you're looking down at the clouds and uh i just had that that realization of like this is real you know when you're a kid and you climb the tree and you get up to the top and you turn around and you're like, terrified how to get down yeah uh, and so was, so when you're sitting there in the ice and you're looking to the west and to the to the south i think you said maybe it was to the north you're sitting there with your dad right and your dad again is not feeling good he's got altitude sickness and now you're what, 200 yards? You're still 200 yards below the summit? Yes. Okay. Exactly. And we're trying to figure out what to do. And we're having this talk, sitting, looking to the north. And uh, we decided to, to go for it. You know, just like all our other trips, uh, it always worked out. And uh, he started to get a little bit more color in his face, too. I gave him some water. And uh, I trusted him. You know, he said he felt pretty good. And so we got up, started to clean ourselves up, getting ready to hike again, tying things up. And as I did that, I looked out the corner of my eye and I saw him kick out. And as he kicked out, I dove quickly, kind of in, uh, instinctively, really. It wasn't really like I had time to think about it. I just dove. And I remember grabbing his jacket and we're facing straight down this, this ice skating ring down the glacier. And I mean, I remember the first... Uh, 
I'm grabbing his jacket and the idea was to get on my ice axe, which was roped to my hip and self-arrest and get on top of that and stop us. And as I did that, it hit a rock, hit something and came up here and blew me up right on my forehead. My ice axe did. And that was the last thing I remember. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe, but we fell. <laughs> we fell 4,000 feet. It was the next thing I remember coming to. Uh, I could hear someone moaning and everything was black. And I was in a hell of a lot of pain. So wait a minute, wait, let me stop. So, so oh, yeah. your your dad slips out, and as he's going down, you guys are now like a gigantic huck, a hockey puck, or going sliding at extreme speeds, and you slide four thousand feet down this face. Is that right? Yeah, I did a bad job of explaining that. Um, it, it is. It's like ice skating ring, but with intermittent rocks and chunks of yeah, ice. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, and. You know, because I got knocked out so early from my ice axe, I kind of went limp, which is maybe why I didn't break anything, but I slid on my face. And so not only was I uh, beaten up, but I, my nose was all the way off. My ear was hanging off. Mm. My ribs were all broken. And uh, probably the, the, the most terrifying thing was I was blind from all the swelling. My head was about the size of a basketball. Yeah. And uh, so I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't see. I mean, I could hear. Anything. I could hear. I couldn't see anything. Um, and I could hear my someone moaning. And I remember, I asked Dad what happened. I don't think I've ever heard my dad swear. And he said, "Matt, don't fucking move." And I'll never forget that. And I knew it was real. And um, and where's your dad now? So you're a mess. And what, what's going on with your dad? Ten or fifteen feet to my right. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on, what happened, and uh, I can hear him moaning. And he had a compound fracture in his calf. His bone is uh, is that your fibula sticking out of his skin compound fracture Ugh. and like to to make a long story short kind of what everything that could go right went right for him his boot filled up with blood and it was so cold it actually froze and kept all the infection out and i'm laying 15 feet away and look like hell you know and he looks over at me and um the next thing that, you know, there's nothing he can do. He can't move because of his leg. And so we're waiting for the rest of our group to, to peek back over and wonder where are these guys, which they should be doing. And, uh, they so, did. Hold, hold, so hold on for a minute. So, okay. So you guys are, are laying down there and, you know, obviously you're severely injured. The other group, uh, the other three had summited. And so, you guys were a not on ropes and B you did not have any kind of communication system like a walkie talkie. Right. We didn't take walkie talkie or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can just see how all these things are piling up. Okay. Keep going. And as they peek over looking for us, they do, they see a red thing of blood right down the middle of the face of the glacier all the way to, uh, to where we stopped. And uh, so they, they, they know someone fell. They don't know where we are. Of course, they're making assumptions and think think it's us. It takes them about an hour and a half to get down. They get down to us, and uh, Frank, one of the gentlemen that's with us, is actually like relieved because he doesn't think it's me. That's how bad I look when he first sees me. And uh, they see my dad. They they put it all together and figure it's me. Of course, after uh, that first reaction, but we laid there for probably two hours and. One of uh, someone in our group did have a phone and made a call to the Mexican village down below us where Senior Reyes, who Senior Reyes, he, he's in the village, but he's like the helicopter pilot, the mountain climbing guy, the, the doctor, you know, kind of everything. And he brings a Mexican group up. And this is about we fell at 10 in the morning. So this Mexican group comes up about noon to one or two and gets to us and starts tending to us and trying to figure out what the hell to do with us. And um, my head trauma is so bad that there, there's no way they're going to try taking me, carrying me off this. There's still about 2,000 feet of volcanic spree they'd have to take me through. And uh, so the idea was to get a helicopter, and they couldn't get a, a helicopter to us that night. I'll leave out a lot of the, the, the details, but I remember this helicopter. You could hear it coming closer, and then it would go away. And he was radioing down the senior Reyes, who was sitting next to me. You know, Patty, he was... They gave me some gloves and some other warm clothes, some sleeping bags, and he was making sure I was okay. But I could hear this helicopter pilot talking violently in Spanish, like, like it wasn't good. <laughs> and you could hear it come and go, and my hope would come, and then it would go away again. And I'll never forget that last time it came around, and I hear him say something to Senior Reyes, and Senior Reyes pats me on the chest and just says, God bless. 
uh, the helicopter can't get up here. You're going to have to spend the night here with your dad. You guys might not make it. You might want to, you might want to say goodbye. And, um, I couldn't, you know, he was so blunt about it. And, um, so we did, we actually had a really good conversation. The helicopter left and senior Reyes and his team went just underneath the lip of the glacier, about a hundred yards South of us, they could get out of the wind in the night and they set up camp to take care of us. And, we were so beaten up. They were really worried. We would try to walk out in the middle of the night and get off the mountain, which they were right. It started getting crazy in the middle of the night. And so they took what was left of our ice axes and stuck us to the glacier. So I couldn't move at night. And that was one of the hardest things for my father was here. Can you imagine laying next to your son 15 feet away and you can't help him in any way. And I started taking off my clothes. I started getting pulmonary edema started taking off my clothes, my gloves, and he couldn't get over there to help me and put them back on. So he basically watched me freeze, which uh, was really tough on him. And uh, uh, I got a question. Uh, so the three guys that had summited that were in your party, the guy, Mike, that you said that was the responsible person who had taken yeah. you to Everest and all these other climbs. So they come down, they find you, and you guys are a mess, obviously. Now they're raiding down to get these other Mexican um, people to come up and help, which they do. Where did the three climbers, the original group, where, where are they in all this? Yeah, yeah you can tell I'm horrible at telling this story. There's too many moving parts. They get asked when the Mexican group gets up about an hour into that whole process, they get told to, to leave or asked to go down just for their own safety. And so they did. At some point, they left and, and went back down to base camp and spent the night at base camp. So, um, you know, one of the guys was my dad's best friend and, uh, he really struggles today. You know, he thinks he should have stayed there and sat next to me. He has a lot of survivor's guilt. Yeah, he should. And I'll be honest, get that. the guy, Mike, who led us, um, like what a jerk. I'll be, I'll be, I just, I'll be off the cuff here. I don't give a shit. Yeah. The guy just walked right by. didn't even care. Walked right past us. And, uh, was real blunt about it and said, you know, mountain climbing, you have to look out for yourself. And it, he was real cold. He never came to the hospital, checked on us or anything. It was really weird. Mm. So we make it through the night somehow. I was, it was a night full of hallucinations. I don't remember much. And miraculously, I can tell it's getting light through my eyelids and I hear a helicopter and uh, miraculously someone on the mountain had a connection with the U S embassy and made a call and an American military helicopter had come down and rescued us. <laughs> put me in a little basket and I remember uh, twirling around in the basket. It dropped me off in a little village. And then I spent about half a day in that village. They dropped my dad off. He's there with me. The rest of our team meets us in this, in this village. And uh, you know, I was laying in the, in like a playground on dirt ground and they're trying to figure out what the hell to do with me. And, uh, and is your dad, I know your dad's legs completely messed up, but is your dad, uh, conscious enough to recognize how severe you are and you know like his 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 hearing his sight all the senses are working with the exception of his legs a mess what was that all in play uh as it relates to he's looking at you and really sizing your severity of what you were going through i don't know the answer to that i've never asked him to be honest with you mark um mm-hmm. uh, I don't think it was till Mexico City to the to till we really realized what what was going on, and that was I, they they took me to the town of Puebla, spent a night there, and then they got me to Mexico City, and Mexico City was where, like I said, reality set in. My head was starting to to, to come down and swelling. They still couldn't get me in a CAT scan. I'd be bouncing off the table. I was I was so cold. Uh, they did my dad's leg, put him back together. Like the second day we were there. And for me, they were waiting for this swelling to come down. And at that point, they would do basically just debreeding, looking at all my wounds and cleaning things out. And um, my fingers, it was that first day in Mexico City that I had noticed my fingers were really, really white. And I had noticed nobody was talking about them. I had asked the doctor twice and he kind of ignored me and and moved on. And uh, no one had said anything. So it was my third day in Mexico city. I'm coming up from a bath actually. And I'm moving my fingers in and out like this, looking at it and all the skin on my ring and index finger just slops off. Mm. And, uh, that was when I knew it was real. You know, I wasn't just coming back with a couple of cool scars and the stories was, 
which was life changing. And a huge part of my story, which I, I don't know if I'll get in, but m- my solution to that was give me more pain meds. And that was a big part of my story. It was uh, really, I struggled a lot getting away from the pain meds and, uh, and that whole battle. That was maybe the hardest thing I did in my whole, the whole story was, uh, was the drug aspect. So let's, let's, let's get into that in a few minutes. So, okay. So you're, you're laying in Mexico city and now they're, they're, you know, one thing leads to another and now you lose essentially all 10 fingers on your hand. So the audience can't see you right now. I can see you and, and, you know, unfortunately it's, uh, you know, it's obviously it's a challenge because we all use our fingers in different ways to eat and cut and write and all those things. So how long really, let me re-ask the question, the transition from realizing your situation to then having to adapt. And I'm sure you were working with some therapy people back in the States on now, like, you know, the bandages come off and now what? I mean, that's where you're jumping, like jumping ahead a lot, but it was, uh, there really wasn't any therapy. It was mad. There's not much get after it, you know, figure it out. And, um, I know the audience can't see. So they saved the life changing thing was saving this, the thumbs. If yeah. they didn't do any of them, my thumbs, I would have been, I would have been doomed. And to, to fill that part in, I had the fingers still on here when they got me back to the States. They're just white. They're turning black They're And the plan was to wait for a month and see where things shook out. <laughs> you can imagine there's not a lot of frostbite specialists in Scottsdale, yeah. let alone anywhere, but it was a month in and we still had these fingers here and they're dying. We didn't know what to do. And the phone rang on Christmas and I pick it up and uh, it's a, a client of ours. Who's a neighbor of Beck Weathers. Yeah. And you know, Beck, who's a well-known climber in the climbing uh, sure. business had his story. And uh, you don't want to be getting a call from someone saying, Hey, you should come talk to Beck about his hands and his yeah. doctor. And uh, that's what I did. So we ended up getting on a plane the next day. I went to Dallas and did all my surgeries so let's let's let me let me just fill the the gap in here. So in 1996, a very famous story uh, from John Krakauer about a bunch of guys that went up into thin air on Mount Everest. Beck Weathers was one of them. He was a surgeon from Dallas, as Matt just mentioned, and uh, he they they ran into insane crazy weather. A bunch of people died. They thought he had died multiple times. Uh, meaning people walked by him at the end of the day, he ended up losing, I think toes and fingers and nose and all kinds of stuff. And it's just this tremendous story of survival. And so I just want to, you know, add a, a, uh, a reference point to, to, to Beck's name and what he had to go through. So anyways, jump back in. Yeah. I mean, that point when I was leading for the trip, one of my work colleagues said, Matt, you know, whatever you do, don't become the next Beck. And how crazy is that? That's exactly who I was becoming. And uh, so we went to Dallas. There was, there's two other people that have had the same surgery that Beck had done this on other outside Beck. And uh, I met Beck. He came met me to the hospital and uh, got to see his hands. I really didn't like what I saw at all, but uh, there was no choice when uh, Anigan, Dr. Anigan was our surgeon. He saw my hands. He knew right away. We were way past uh, time. I had gangrene so bad said, Matt, if we don't do these hands in the next next day or so, you could lose both of them completely. So we went right into surgery. And um, at the core of the surgery is they take your back muscle, your latissimus, they call it a pre-flap, and flap that over. Uh, you know, frostbite basically is you're losing vascularity. So your, your muscles stop getting oxygen. Mm-hmm. And the muscle basically is a, is a tool that can provide oxygen. So by planting the muscle over the hand, they can save some of the finger, which they have. And so you asked about usage, other than pick my nose, which in all seriousness, probably I miss the most. Um, <laughs> I think I figured out, you know, pretty much I can do everything else. Uh, my golf game, I'm, I'm trying to figure out that still, but I don't know, tying shoes, all the daily stuff was easy, easy peasy compared to, uh, to looking in the mirror. You know, I think that's the biggest thing I realized being on this side of the fence is I always thought people that were in wheelchairs or things of that nature, disabilities, it was the disability of the, the physical aspect. And it's not, you know, life is like, it's so beautiful. There's all, you know, I ran into running, all these new things I got, you know, as soon as I just realized it was a door open and all I had to do was walk through and accept it, everything changed. But looking in the mirror was the hardest part, you know, as an athlete, 
I was defined by my hands in so many ways. You know, I played mm-hmm. guitar. <laughs> my nickname was sports in high school. And here I was looking in the mirror trying to figure out, like, who, who the hell am I? Now, now what do I do? And uh, as a 22-year-old kid to wake up and, 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 and I'm not alone, by the way. I, I was in a hospital full of millions of other people that go through incredible stories just like mine, you know? And uh, anyhow, so I'm all over the place. But um, did all the surgeries in Dallas. The right hand was 12, left was 13, and then had about 10 to 12 other surgeries throughout the next few months. And uh, the last surgery was on my toes, and I picked up MRSA and almost died from that. I had staph infection for a couple of years and had a pick line. So um, I just couldn't escape it because of that staff. And, and one of the saving points was uh, I came across an old pair of running shoes, and I hated running. You know, I thought running was for for people who were too uncoordinated to do anything else. You know, and um, but I, I put them on, and I remember it took a half an hour or so to tie my shoes the first time. But it was important that I learned, and, and uh, I remember that was pretty much the core of my workout for the first week was tying my shoes. And then it turned into a mile and two mile and three mile. And, uh, I became a runner. <laughs> and, uh, as you know, I think, I think, you know, I'm running Leadville 100 in August and, uh, I'm running Leadville and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it around, uh, <laughs> I, I partnered with a group called K2 Adventures who, uh, amazing group. They, they help people with disabilities do incredible things. So they led the first blind guy up Everest. They've done amazing things. And they're going to help me uh, I'm partnering with their limb loss program. So trying to raise money and there's kind of a run with Matt program where we're developing oh, yeah. and uh, all the money goes, you know, cause I'm real passionate about that. Mark, when you, when you look in the mirror for anyone like this, that you have such a lo- loss of self-worth and self-confidence. And I learned there's no shortcuts to self-worth and, and confidence. You can't, you know, it, it's, it has to be authentic. And for me, I struggled and having that physical exercise and someone introducing me to running and giving me the opportunities to try a race and things like that. It allowed me to, to, to feel like I was a, a man again, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, if I could give that opportunity to some other kid or individual who's lost a limb or gone through it, I it's just, I'm really passionate about it. So I'm really excited about that. And that's in August. So, so let me interrupt you. So Leadville, I just want to tap into to that for a minute. So yeah. Leadville's insane. And it's uh, the city, the small town of Leadville is in Colorado. It's uh, located at 10,000 feet. And these, these races that they do go up to 14. And then it's, it's, it's more or less a loop. But, you know, it's really difficult because of the altitude and all those things. But, you know, it's hardcore. And, um, you know, my hat's off to you. Another thing that you were talking about before is about I certainly haven't gone through any physical transformations, um, but I've gone through a lot of internal transformations. And you're right. When you leave football, you mentioned this when you left your your sport. You know, it's like driving off a cliff. A lot of the military are going through the same thing. You know, they're with their brotherhood and there was all that camaraderie in the locker room, as you mentioned. And then all of a sudden, one day, it's just like, you're out. And now what are you going to do? So trying to fill that that void. And so it's so cool that your dad wanted to continue to, to involve you in different things. And he he had this great idea at the time, you know, to go down and climb a big mountain. And, and certainly there's a lot of bonding, you know, when it all goes right, that can take place there. But like you experienced, it can all go wrong too. And and I, I think the final thing here is is – is as it relates to your story, which I love, which is if you're if you can open your heart and your mind to it, where one door closes, another one can always open. And for me, when I went through my rough patch ten years ago, it's led me into climbing. It's led me into doing podcasting. It's led me into working with these different um, organizations and raising almost one hundred fifty thousand dollars in the last couple of years. And and that has been the gift. That has been the gift. And if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have been given that gift. And so that's what I'm so, and that's what you're, you're saying. Um, I want to jump back in just a minute. And it sounds like for all the obvious reasons that you're going through a lot of pain. And so to help, you know, get you through that from the head injuries that you have in the fingers, they're probably giving you some pain meds. And then it sounds like you got into um, a situation where, you were either addicted to them or really dependent and, and that kind of led you down another uh, rabbit hole. Yeah. I just, I, 
it was it was two years after the accident until I finally came off pain meds. You know, they had loaded me up on oxycodone, and uh, mm. Greg and Dr. Anigan came in and uh, told us. You know, he said, "Matt, uh, Dennis, and Gene, that's my parents' aunt. Matt's biggest issue is not going to be learning how to use his hands. He's going to wake up from all this and be a drug addict." I'll never forget him saying that. And um, getting off the oxycodone immediately after two years was was incredibly tough, unbelievable. But what happened was they put me on another drug called tramadol, which was a non-narcotic that is supposed to have some opiate-like uh, effect and it was non-addictive, blah, blah. Anyhow, it, it ended up being extremely addictive and it's controlled substance now. And I struggled with that. And it wasn't that I was, I mean, I did my master's degree, did 12 marathons on it. it I, my life wasn't out of, you know, it, it was a solution for me. It helped me as a crutch to deal with the anxiety and the things that I wasn't ready for yet in the work world. But on the negative is that's only a, as you know, a, a bandaid, a short-term solution. At some problem, at some point that solution becomes the problem. And it did at some point it just, it, you know, it was w- one pill doesn't do it anymore. So you got to take two, et cetera, et cetera. And it just prevented all of the healing from happening. When you're under the influence like that of anything, the, the true grief of what I went through didn't really happen until years later when I, when I got off all that. And so th- that's all I mean by that. I just think it's a horrible thing in our, our society that is so overlooked, that is so abundant everywhere. And, uh, you know, if I, if I, if I, if I open up to people about this at all, it's amazing the amount of people that want to share with me their addiction issues or things that are going on. Mm. And, you know, there's, I just Googled, there's over 15,000. If you just take Walmart, CVS and Walgreens, there's over 15,000 pharmacies in the United States. <laughs> you know, that's crazy. If you do the math, it's, uh, it's insane. It's a lot of drugs. That's why, you, you know, on the commercials, you always see, you know, when in between every, if all your favorite shows, many times you see drug pharmaceutical companies, you know, pushing their, whatever they're doing. So now it sounds like you've now gone through a lot of stuff and and you're at a place today where not only are you challenging yourself and doing these big runs like Leadville 100, you're also public speaking, you're working, you're married. And so are, are you at that place now where you're comfortable in your own skin, you have a direction versus when you first came out of college, when you were lost, I was too, by the way. Um, after the NFL, are you, do you feel like you're on common ground now in terms of going forward and inspiring people and helping them any way you can? Yes and no. I feel like I'm just getting going. Um, so I'm in, I'm in wealth management and I work with a lot of retirees and, and I'm very passionate about that because I share one thing in common with them is I know what it's like to wake up and have everything be different the next day. (laughs) Same ego identity thing we're talking about just a minute ago. So I love that, that I get to help them and, and, and being an advisor, you know, it's really a glorified psychologist is what I am. (laughs) It's helping people make, prevent people from making dumb decisions and keeping them uh, in their seats. But what what the changing point was, my my website's called Clarity Lifestyle Company. I don't know if if you check that out at all. Clarity starts with a K. And the whole concept that is, is, is exactly the question you're asking for me, I struggled so much with trying to find, I, I, I wasn't going to show up and sit in a cubicle all day. I needed to find what it felt, what it felt like to walk out onto that baseball diamond. I want to find that every day. And then I want to do that every day. Life's too short not to, uh-huh. you know, and, and when you have clarity like that, it simplifies life. You know, when you wake up and you know the one thing you want to do each day, it simplifies things and uh, it puts everything else in the priority. And for me, for years, it was get better at baseball. Well, now what is it? And I, I was looking really for the wrong things. And, and you know what my clarity is? It's, it's helping people. If I'm helping someone, and it could be from putting the, the toothpaste cap back on, to rebalancing someone's portfolio, to helping an addict, whatever, I, I can do that for days. And I, I don't care how much I'm getting paid. And, and I feel there's so much I can share still with my hands that I have not I think you can tell today when we talk through the story, like I'm all over the place with the story. I, I haven't succinctly figured out a way to, to articulate this well and get the, get the things off I really want to talk about. So to answer your question is, yeah, I, I found my clarity and it's helping people. And 
the, the, the speaking and the coaching and some of this, it, it'll, it'll happen where God takes it and whatever happens, happens. Um, as long as I just keep helping people though, I, uh, I'm going to be all right. You know, look, I, I've done quite a few of these, these podcasts now. And, and I think I've, I've had a couple people where, where it's almost like a push start and they have this buttoned up package yeah, you know what what they delivered to me, and it didn't come across as authentic. And what your experience is real life, you know, you're going through this, you're going through that, you're falling off the mountain, your dad's in jeopardy, and it's kind of like a lot of times the way I think our thoughts go, which is you've got like a hundred thousand comments like shooting all over your head with ideas all at one time, and you're just trying to figure out like which ones do I pull out of the air, and how does the whole story? So for me you were very clear in your message. You're very clear on what happened. You're very clear on, you know, the struggles that you had, you know, going out, um, uh, you know, post the accident, you know, how you guys, you know, navigate your way out there finally on the helicopter and then back to the States and Beck weather's coming. I mean, there's, there's just so much information, you know, like where do you start, but the best place to start is wherever you feel like you should start, which you did. And you're, you, I think you're going to help a lot of people. They're going to be inspired by you. And, you know, we all, that's why I, I didn't realize it at the time when I just, you know, like, what am I going to name this podcast? And, you know, since I was in the mountain, it was all about kind of me initially, like finding my summit, like my own summit. And as I, as I got into it, it was really finding your summit and everybody has to climb different things and they're all mountains and they're all hard. And at the end of the day, they can be messy, but it's where you end, not where you start. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and authenticity is a huge part of, I think, what I want to be about. But um, there's so many parts I left out. The Senate, there's a great Senator McCain story. There's all kinds of, and that's the type of stuff I get done. I go, God, why didn't I talk about that? But, well, let's uh, talk about McCain. McCain was a great senator for <laughs> the U.S. and uh, uh, represented the great state of Arizona. So give us your, your McCain story yeah. real quick. McCain was a launching point for kind of uh, a turning point for me. It was right when I got back to the States. I had come home. They were taking me out to the burn unit here in Phoenix and clean my wounds out. And they brought me home. And as they wheel me in the wheelchair, uh, they opened the front door of my house. And there's, there's John McCain on that couch. And uh, I had a mutual friend growing up who had a, shared a cabin with, with them up in Sedona. And so growing up, I used to fish up there and still trout out of his, his pond all the time. So I wouldn't say we were friends, but we knew each other, you know. And he had heard the story and you know, the kindness of his heart. It was right around when he was running came over and uh, took the time and it was incredible. You know, I was a kid and as a kid, you don't have much of a care for senators at that point and uh, read much respect either, maybe for, uh, for POWs, some of that story as well. But he sat down and, and told me this incredible story about just, and he was so present, he wasn't on any agenda and uh, told me about what it was like in prison camp and that most of the people wanted to die. There's two types of people. He said, because Matt, there's two types of people. The majority just wanted to die. It was so miserable in there that they allowed the external world to affect their internal world. And because, but one day I made a decision that I was not, you know, they could, they could keep me in prison externally, but they could never imprison me internally. And every time they came and hit me and beat me, he goes, I was going to take this and, and embrace this and use this as a uh, fuel for when I get out of here. And he goes, you, you have that same gift if you want. But he was real blunt. And he said, I want you to know, like, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done and beyond what you're expecting. And you're either going to make it or you're not. And it's up to you. And he was dead right. Um, he was dead right. I mean, it's like I tell addicts, recovering addicts that if you make it through this and survive, you're going to be like one of the best human beings alive. <laughs> You have to, there's no, there's no underground. It's, you, you know, you got to change one thing and it's everything. And uh, for me though, that was really powerful because I had, I had no, no, uh, there's no optimism at that point. You know, I had no idea what light ahead and just to hear someone tell me it was going to be okay. <laughs> and especially someone like that, it was just, uh, it meant a lot to me. It still does. Well, look, it, it's a, it's a great story from a great man. And uh, we all, I said this at the very beginning of the uh, the podcast, we all need inspiration. And, and I think a lot of times too, when you look up at people like that, a great Senator person who has run for president, you know, Vietnam, 
war hero, you don't think that they have problems, but they, you know, we all do. We all pull our pants on the same way and you're no different. I'm no different. And those were all things. So uh, let's wrap this up. Where can people find you? Uh, you may have mentioned the website earlier, but I just want to make sure that everybody, you know, has an opportunity. I also, also want to give a shout out to Raj for uh, connecting us. Um, uh, much, much, much appreciated. I don't know how you know Raj, but what a great guy. I met Raj only once and he has been nothing but a kind soul to me. So yeah, I'm glad you, glad you mentioned that. You can, yeah. uh, best way to find me is www.clarityLifestyleCompany.com and Clarity is with a K. Yeah, I didn't think of uh, that long domain when I, when I uh, came up with that of explaining it to people, but ClarityLifestyleCompany.com and that's with a K. Love that. That's with a K. It's full of clarity and he's got a great story. Okay. So, Hey Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, you know, I know you're going to inspire a lot of people that um, are going through whatever they're going through right now and know that there's always another side to it. Okay. Yeah. I love what you're doing. I appreciate you having me on. It's really, really kind of you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. There is the one, the only Matt Miller. Thank you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.